In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, one with Louisa, the little daughter of the Divine Will, I enter into the Holy Divine Will. Come, Divine Will, come beat in my every heartbeat, come breathe in my every breath, come pray, adore, and reign in me. In the name of everyone and everything, past, present, and future, in, with, through, and for Jesus, Mary, and Louisa, in, with, and for all, that all may be for the glory of God and the good of all souls, giving to God as if all lived in the most holy divine will. United with creation, redemption, and sanctification, praying as one in that one eternal act. For the kingdom to come, reign on earth. Fiat. Book of Heaven, Volume 16, Part 10 February 10, 1924 Necessity of Complete Abandonment in the Divine Will The doctrine on the Divine Will is the purest, the most beautiful, and through it the Church shall be renewed and the face of the earth transformed. I was thinking to myself about all that was written in these past days, and I said to myself that they were neither necessary nor serious things, that I could have done without putting them on paper. But obedience wanted it so, and I had the duty to say fiat also in this. But as I was thinking about this, my beloved Jesus told me, Yet, my daughter, everything was necessary in order to make known how to live in my will. By not saying everything, you would cause some quality of how to live in it to be missing, and therefore they could not have the full effect of the living in my will. As for example, on the abandonment of living in my will, if the soul did not live completely abandoned in my will, she would be like someone who lived in a sumptuous palace and now leaned out of a window, now out of a balcony, now went down to the main door. So only seldom or in passing does the poor one pass through some of the rooms, and therefore she knows little of the regime, of the work that is needed, of the goods that are there present of what she can take and of what she can give. Who knows how many goods are in there, and she knows little about it. Therefore she does not love that palace as she should love it, nor does she esteem it as it deserves. Now for the soul who lives in my will and is not completely abandoned in it, self-reflections, cares for herself, fears, disturbances are nothing other than windows, balconies, and main doors that she forms in my will. And by going out very often, she is forced to see and feel the miseries of human life. And since the miseries are her own property, while the riches of my will are mine, she becomes more attached to the miseries than to the riches, 
and so she shall not come to love, nor shall she enjoy what it means to live in my will. And having formed the main door, one day or another she shall go away to live in the miserable hovel of her own will. See then how complete abandonment in me is necessary in order to live in my will. My will does not need the miseries of the human will. It wants the creature to live together with it. Beautiful. Just as it delivered her from its womb. Without the miserable provision that she has formed for herself in the exile of life. Otherwise there would be disparity. That would bring sorrow to my will. And unhappiness to the human will. Do you see how necessary it is? to make them understand that complete abandonment is needed in order to live in my will? And you say it was not necessary to write about it? I feel compassion for you, because you do not see what I see, and therefore you take it lightly. But in my all-seeingness, I see that these writings shall be for my church like a new sun that shall rise in her midst, and drawn by its blazing light, creatures shall apply themselves in order to be transformed into this light and become spiritualized and divinized in such a way that, as the church shall be renewed, they shall transform the face of the earth. The doctrine on my will is the purest, the most beautiful, not subject to any shadow of the material or of interest, both in the supernatural and in the natural order. Therefore, like sun, it shall be the most penetrating, the most fecund, and the most welcomed and appreciated. And being light of its own, it shall make itself understood and shall make its way. It shall not be subject to doubts or suspicions of error. And if some word is not understood, it shall be because of too much light that eclipsing the human intellect shall not allow them to comprehend the whole fullness of the truth. However, they shall find not a word that is not truth at the most, they shall not be able to comprehend it fully. Therefore, in view of the good that I see, I push you to neglect nothing in writing, one saying, one effect, one simile about my will can be like beneficial dew upon souls, just as dew is beneficial on the plants after a day of burning sun or like a pouring rain after long months of drought. You cannot understand all the good, the light, the strength contained in each word. But your Jesus knows it, and knows the ones whom it must serve, and the good it must do. Now, as he was saying this, he showed me a table in the middle of the church, and all the writings about the divine will placed upon it. Many venerable people surrounded that table and became transformed into light and divinized. And as they walked, they communicated that light to whomever they encountered. Then Jesus added, You shall see this great good from heaven when the church shall receive this celestial food that shall strengthen her and make her rise again in her full triumph. February 16, 1924 Immense Sorrow and Infinite Joys of the Heart of Jesus The one who, with love and submission, shares in his sorrows, also shares in his joys. I was thinking about the sorrows of the Most Holy Heart of Jesus. 
Oh, how my pains disappeared when compared to his. And my always lovable Jesus told me, My daughter, the sorrows of my heart are indescribable and inconceivable to human creature. You must know that each beat of my heart was a distinct sorrow. Each heartbeat brought me a new sorrow, one different from the other. Human life is a continuous palpitating. If the heartbeat ceases, life ceases. Imagine now what torrents of sorrow each beat of my heart brought me up to the last moment of my dying. From the moment I was conceived up to my last heartbeat, it did not spare me, bringing me new pains and bitter sorrows. However, you must also know that my divinity, that was inseparable from me, watching over my heart while letting a new sorrow enter at each heartbeat, at each heartbeat it also let enter new joys, new contentments, new harmonies, and celestial secrets. If I was rich in sorrow, and my heart enclosed immense seas of pain. I was also rich in happiness, in infinite joys, and in unreachable sweetness. I would have died at the first heartbeat of sorrow if the divinity, loving this heart with infinite love, had not let each heartbeat resound in two within my heart. Sorrow and joy bitterness and sweetness, pains and contentments, death and life, humiliation and glory, human abandonments and divine comforts. Oh, if you could look into my heart, you would see everything centralized in me, all possible and imaginable sorrows, from which creatures rise again to new life, and all contentments and divine riches that flow within my heart like many seas as I diffuse them for the good of the whole human family. But who shares more in these immense treasures of my heart? The one who suffers more. For each pain, for each sorrow, there, a special joy in my heart that follows that pain or sorrow suffered by the creature. Sorrow renders her more dignified, more lovable, more dear, more worthy of sympathy. And just as my heart drew upon itself all divine sympathies by virtue of the sorrows suffered, in seeing sorrow in the creature, that is a special characteristic of my heart. Watching over this sorrow, with all love, I pour upon her the joys and contentments that my heart contains. But to my highest sorrow, while my heart would want to let my joys follow the sorrow I send to creatures, not finding in them love of suffering and true resignation like those that my heart had. My joys follow the sorrow, but in seeing that the sorrow has not been received with love and honor and with highest submission, my joys do not find the way to enter that sorrowful heart. And grieving they come back into my heart Therefore, when I find a soul who is resigned, who is lover of suffering, I feel her as though regenerated within my heart. And oh, how sorrows and joys, bitternesses and sweetnesses alternate. I hold nothing back of all the goods that I can pour into her. February 18, 1924 All created things 
near and far, known and unknown, have one single sound. I love you. And each of them carries a distinct love. I was fusing myself in the divine will according to my usual way, in order to find all created things and to be able to give my return of love for myself and for all. Now as I was doing this, I thought to myself, My Jesus says that he has created everything for love of me and for love of each one. But how can this be if many created things I don't even know? So many fishes that dart in the sea, so many birds that fly in the air, so many plants, so many flowers, such great variety of beauty contained in the whole universe. Who knows them? Just a small number of them. Therefore, if I don't even know them, especially I, then, who have been confined in a bed for years and years, how can he say that all created things have the mark, the seal of his I love you for me? Now, while I was thinking of this, my sweet Jesus moved in my interior, in the act of pricking up his ears in order to listen to me, and told me, My daughter, yet it is true that each created thing has a distinct love for you. It is also true that you do not know them all. But this says nothing. On the contrary, it reveals to you my love even more, and tells you in clear notes that my I love you for you is both near and far from you, both hidden and unveiled. I do not act like creatures who, when they are close, are all love, but as soon as they move away, they become cold and are no longer able to love. My love is stable and fixed. It is near as much as it is far, hidden and secret. It has one single sound, never interrupted. I love you. See, you know the light of the sun, it is true. Indeed, you receive its light and its heat as much as you want. But more light surpasses you, so much as to fill the whole earth. If you wanted more light, the sun would give it to you, even all of it. Now, all the light of the sun tells you, my I love you, both that which is near and that which is far. Even more, as it covers the earth, it carries the little sonata of my I love you for you. And yet, you know neither the paths that the light covers, nor the lands it illuminates, nor the people who enjoy the beneficial influence of the solar ray. But even though you do not know everything that the light does, you are in that same light. And if you do not take it all, it is because you lack the capacity to be able to absorb it into yourself. But in spite of this, you cannot say that all the light of the sun does not say to you, I love you. On the contrary, it makes a greater display of love. Because as it invades the earth, it keeps narrating my I love you to all. And the same for all the drops of water. You cannot drink them all and enclose them within yourself. But in spite of this, you cannot say that they do not tell you my I love you. So all created things, whether known or unknown, all have the mark of my I love you, because all of them serve the harmony of the universe, the decorum of creation, the mastery of our creative hand. I acted like a rich and tender father who loves his son, 
since the son has to leave the paternal house to take his position, the father prepares a sumptuous palace with innumerable rooms, each of which contains a certain something that can be of use to his son. Now, since those rooms are many, the son does not always see them. Even more, some of them he does not know, because no necessity to use them has arisen for him. But in spite of this, can anyone perhaps deny that in each room there is a special paternal love for the son, as the paternal goodness has provided also for that which might or might not be necessary to the son? So I did. This son came out of my womb, and I wanted him to lack nothing. Even more, I created many different things, and some enjoy one thing, some another. But everything has one single sound. I love you. February 20th, 1924. Had there been other souls in the church to have lived in the divine will before Louisa, or other manifestations about it, Jesus would have made use of his power to make the sublime way of living in his will manifest. To live in the divine will means to make the pure joys of the purpose of creation return to God. After all that my sweet Jesus has told me about his most holy will, I was thinking to myself, how can it ever be possible that there has not been one soul until now who has lived in the divine volition, and that I am the first one? Who knows how many others there have been before me, and in a more perfect, a more active way than mine? But while I was saying this, my always lovable Jesus moved in my interior and told me, My daughter, why do you not want to recognize the gift, the grace, your mission of having been called in a way all special and new to live in my will? Had there been other souls in my church before you, since the living in my will is the most important thing? the thing that interests me the most, and for which I care so much, there would have been the traces, the norms, the teachings in my church, from those who would have had the chance to live life in my will. There would have been the knowledges, the attractions, the effects, and the goods that this living in my will contains. Had there been many other manifestations, I would have made use of my power, making the sublime way of living in my will shine forth. In view of my great satisfaction, and in seeing myself honored by the soul with the glory of my own will, I would have put that soul in such a tight corner that she could not have resisted manifesting what I wanted. Just as there are sayings and teachings on living resigned, patient, obedient, and so forth, there would have been this also. It would have been quite funny and strange if I had kept the thing which I love the most hidden. Rather, the more one loves something, the more one wants to make it known the more satisfaction and glory a way of living brings me, the more I want to diffuse it. It is not in the nature of true love to hide what can make others happy and rich. If you knew how I longed for this time in which my little newborn of my will would come to the light to make you live in my volition... What a cortege of grace I prepared in order to obtain the intent. You would remain stunned and would be more grateful and attentive to me. 
Ah, you do not know what it means to live in my will. It means to make the pure joys of the purpose of creation, my innocent amusements of the reason why I created man, return to me. It means to remove from me all the bitterness that the perfidious human will gave me almost at the dawn of creation. It means a continuous exchange between human will and divine will, as the soul, fearing her own, lives of mine, while mine keeps filling the soul with joys, love, and infinite goods. Oh, how happy I feel in being able to give whatever I want to this soul, because my will contains such capacity as to be able to receive everything. So there are no longer divisions between me and her, but stable union in operating, in thinking, in loving, because my will makes up for everything. So we remain in perfect accord and in communion of goods. This had been the purpose of the creation of man, to have him live as our own child and to place all our goods in common with him so that he might be fully happy and we might be amused with his happiness. Now to live in my will is precisely this, to have the purpose, the joys, the feasts of creation return to us. And you say that I should have kept it hidden in my church without letting it come out? I would have turned heaven and earth upside down. I would have confounded the hearts with an irresistible strength in order to make known that which shall be the fulfillment of creation. Do you see how much I care for this living in my will, which places the seal upon all my works, so that all of them may be complete? To you, perhaps, this may seem nothing, or that there are similar things in my church. No, no, to me, on the contrary, it is the all of my works, and you must appreciate it as such, and be more attentive in fulfilling the mission I want from you. February 22nd, 1924, God enjoyed the pure joys of creation until man sinned. Then he enjoyed them again when the Most Holy Virgin came to the light, and then when the Word descended upon her. Finally, he shall enjoy them, and in a continuous way, when creatures live in the divine will. For this purpose he has chosen Louisa as the first one, and as the example, depositing in her the celestial law of his will. I was thinking about what is written above, and I said to myself, How is it possible that the blessed Lord, after so many centuries, has not enjoyed the pure joys of creation, and that he is waiting for the living in the divine will in order to receive these joys, this glory, and the purpose for which everything was created. Now, while I was thinking of this and other things, my sweet Jesus made himself seen in my interior, and through a light that he sent to my intellect, he told me, My daughter, the pure joys of creation, my innocent amusements with the creatures, I did enjoy, but at intervals not continuously. And when things are not stable and continuous, they increase one's sorrow even more. They cause one to yearn more to enjoy them again, and one would make any sacrifice to render them permanent. In the first place, I enjoyed the pure joys of creation 
when after I had created everything, I created man, until he sinned. Between him and us there was highest accord, common joys, innocent amusements. Our arms were always open to embrace him, to give him new joys, new graces, and by giving we amused ourselves so much as to form a continuous feast for ourselves and for him. For us to give is to rejoice. It is happiness. It is amusement. But as soon as he sinned and broke his will from ours, everything ended. Because since the fullness of our will was no longer in him, the current, in order to be able to give and to continue the life of mutual happiness, was missing. More so, since our will missing in him, the capacity and the safeguard in order to keep our gifts was missing. In the second place, we enjoyed the pure joys of creation when, after many centuries, the Immaculate Virgin came to the light of the day. Because she had been preserved from even a shadow of sin, and she possessed all the fullness of our will, and between her and us, there was not a shadow of split between her will and ours. Our joys, our innocent amusements, were returned to us. She brought to us all the feasts of creation as though on her lap, and we gave her so much, and amused ourselves so much in giving, as to enrich her in every instant with new graces, new contentments, new beauty, to the point that she could not contain more. But the empress creature did not last long on earth. She passed into heaven, and we could not find another creature in the low world who would perpetuate our amusements and bring us the joys of creation. In the third place, we enjoyed the joys of creation when I, eternal word, descended from heaven and took on my humanity. Ah, by possessing the fullness of my will, my beloved mamma had opened the currents between heaven and earth. She had put everyone in feast, heaven and earth, and the divinity being in feast out of love for a creature so holy, made me conceived in her virginal womb, giving her the divine fecundity, so as to let me fulfill the great work of redemption. If there had not been this excelling virgin, who took primacy in my will and lived perfect life in my volition, living in it as if she did not have her own will, and by doing so, placing the joys of creation and our feasts in current, the eternal word would never have come upon earth to fulfill the redemption of mankind. See then how the greatest thing, the most important, the most pleasing, and that attracts God the most, is the living in my will and the one who lives in it conquers God and makes God give gifts so great as to astonish heaven and earth, gifts that for centuries upon centuries could not be obtained. Oh, how my humanity, being on earth and containing the very life of the supreme volition, even more it was inseparable from me, brought to the divinity in a wholly complete way all the joys, the glory, the requital of love of the whole creation. And the divinity was so delighted as to give me primacy over everything and the right to judge all peoples. Oh, what good did creatures obtain knowing that a brother of theirs who loved them so much and had suffered so much in order to place them in safety, was to be their judge. 
in seeing the whole purpose of creation enclosed in me, the divinity, as though stripping itself of everything, conceded to me all rights over all creatures. But my humanity passed into heaven, and no one was left on earth who would perpetuate the full living in the divine volition, and therefore, rising above everyone and everything in our will, would bring us the pure joys, and would let us continue our innocent amusements with a terrestrial creature. So our joys were interrupted, our amusements broken on the face of the earth. On hearing this, I said, My Jesus, how can it be as you say? It is true that our mamma passed into heaven, and so did your humanity. But did you not bring the joys with you, so as to be able to continue your innocent amusements in heaven with your celestial father? And Jesus, the joys of heaven are our own, and no one can take them away from us or diminish them. But those that come to us from the earth, we are in the act of acquiring, and the game is formed precisely in act of the new acquirements, between the acquirement of the victory or of the defeat. So are the joys of the acquirement formed, and if one is defeated, sorrows are formed. Now let's come to us, my daughter. When I came upon earth, man was so engulfed in evil and so full of human will that the living in my will could find no place. So in my redemption, first I impetrated for him the grace of resignation to my will, because in the state he was in, he was incapable of receiving the greatest gift the living in my will. And then I impetrated for him the greatest grace, as crown and fulfillment of all graces, the living in my will, so that our pure joys of creation and our innocent amusements would resume their course once again on the face of the earth. See, about twenty centuries have passed since the true and pure joys of creation were interrupted, because we did not find sufficient capacity, total stripping of the human will, to be able to entrust the property of our will. Now, in order to do this, we had to choose a creature who would be more proximate and associated with the human generations. Had I placed my mamma as the example, they would have felt very distant from her and would have said, How could she not live in the divine will since she was exempt from any stain, even of origin? Therefore they would have shrugged their shoulders and would not have given it a thought. And if I had placed my humanity as the example, they would have been frightened even more and would have said, He was God and man, and since the divine will was his own life, it is no wonder that he lived in the supreme volition. Therefore, so that this living in my will might have life in my church, I was to go down the ladder, descend lower, and choose a creature from their midst providing her with sufficient graces and making my way into her soul. I was to empty her of everything, making her understand the great evil of the human will, so that she would abhor it so much as to choose death rather than doing her own will. Then, giving her the gift of my divine will, Assuming the attitude of teacher, I made her understand all the beauty, the power, the effects, the value, and the way in which she was to live in my eternal will. 
so that she might live in it. I established in her the law of my will. I acted as in a second redemption, in which I established the gospel, the sacraments, the teachings, as primary life in order to be able to continue the redemption. Had I left nothing as the foundation, what would creatures cling to? What to do? So I did for the living in my will. How many teachings have I not given you? How many times have I not led you by the hand in the eternal flights in my volition? And you, hovering over the whole creation, have brought the pure joys of creation to the feet of the divinity, and we have amused ourselves with you. Now, because we have chosen a creature who apparently has no great disparity from them, they shall take courage. And finding the teachings, the way, and knowing the great good contained in the living in my will, they shall make it their own. And so the pure joys of creation and our innocent amusements shall no longer be broken on the face of the earth. And even if there should be but one for each generation to live in our will, it shall always be feast for us. And in the feasts, there is always a greater display, and one is more generous in giving. Oh, how many goods they shall obtain for the earth, while their creator amuses himself on its plains. Therefore, my dear daughter, be attentive to my teachings, because this is about letting me found a law, not terrestrial, but celestial not a law of mere sanctity, but a divine law, a law that shall no longer let one distinguish the terrestrial citizens from the celestial ones, a law of love, that destroying everything that can prevent, even in the slightest, the union of the creature with her creator, shall place all his goods in common, removing from her all the weaknesses and miseries of original sin. The law of my will shall place so much strength in the soul as to serve her as sweet enchantment, in such a way as to put to sleep the evils of her nature and substitute them with the sweet enchantment of the divine goods. Remember how many times you have seen me write in the depth of your soul? It was the new law of the living in my will. And first I delighted in writing it in order to expand your capacity. And then I took the attitude of teacher in order to explain it to you. How many times have you not seen me taciturn and pensive in the depth of your soul? It was the great crafting of my will that I was forming. And you, not seeing me speak, lamented that I did not love you any more. Ah, it was precisely then that pouring out upon you, my will would enlarge your capacity, would confirm you in it, and would love you the most. Therefore, do not want to investigate anything of what I do, but rest, secure, always in my will. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 16, Part 10. Fiat. Dearest Lord Jesus, I thank you for your lessons of today. Free me from living one single instant outside of your will. Have pity on me and do not permit that I either know or acquire any other life except that of your divine will. Fiat et Amen. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.